This week on the podcast, thermal coal, deforestation and nuclear waste. What's Australia's climate future going to look like? Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News podcast. My name is Isaac Nellis and I'm talking to you from Gadigal country in Sydney. And I'm Riley Breen, I'm talking to you from the land of the Wadjuk Noongar here in Perth, Bully Perth. And today on the podcast, we're talking climate. Uh, and the climate crisis. Later on, we're going to be talking to Peter Boyle, who's a Green Left journalist and socialist activist. Um, But before we get to that, uh, we're going to look at some of the kind of recent uh, climate news um, that uh, has come out of uh, Australia and also internationally. Um, Because there's a whole bunch of different things going and it's hard to, you know, keep keep the coverage up on the podcast each week um, when there's so many things happening. So we thought we'd combine a bunch of stories together for this week's episode. Um, so before we get started, I'd just like to mention, obviously we are recording on stolen land that was never ceded and always was, always will be Aboriginal land and Green Left pledges to stand with First Nations people in campaigns for justice, sovereignty, land rights and self-determination, uh, across the country and around the world. Uh, we'd also like to mention, uh, if you'd like to help this podcast keep going, you can become a supporter from $5 a month at greenleft.org.au forward slash support and it makes a massive difference uh help us continue um so to kick it off uh with some of the uh, environment news so the environment defenders office the lock the gate alliance and the hunter environment lobby said that glencore and yan cole's decision to withdraw one of the two open coal mine expansions in the hunter valley is good news but unfortunately it's not the end of the matter so Basically, Glencore and Yancol were seeking approval from New South Wales and federal governments to uh, mine an additional 780 million tonnes of thermal coal over the 25 years. And um, something that's worth pointing out that we talked about with Zach Schofield the other week on the podcast, thermal coal is pretty much exclusively for export. It's not used for energy in here in Australia and it's not used for uh, steel production, things like that, or gets exported. Um, so basically they wanted to, you know, uh, expand uh, two of their open cut coal mines. Uh, the reason they've withdrawn one of those is because uh, basically their, their initial plan has failed to meet the kind of climate guidelines. Uh, so instead of getting it rejected, they've withdrawn it and they're going to um, basically attempt to recraft it in a way that uh, makes it more uh, likely to succeed. Um, so it's that's why it's kind of not it's kind of a win in some ways but you know there's a long way to go before it's actually complete and as we know uh tanya plibersek the environment minister has recently uh expanded uh given approvals for three expansions uh, of coal mines on september 25. um one of these three uh just to go into a little bit more detail is the uh glencore and yang coals ashton and ravensworth coal mines which have been given permission and that those cover the air an area the size of the sydney and Grandler electorate so if, if you're in sydney you'll know these areas but it's basically the kind of the sydney cbd and uh in a west area which is a massive area where uh so you can see that the, the the coal mine expansions are these huge areas they're not just you know adding a tiny little section they're, they're massively expanding them um so that's an interesting one we're going to have to keep following these coal mine expansions across New South Wales seem to keep popping up and uh, keep up the pressure to to stop them from happening. Yeah, and um, more environmental stuff in your neck of the woods, New South Wales. Um, forest campaigners have renewed efforts to, to stop the New South Wales Forestry Corporation from log, logging in um, Bulga State Forest. I hope I got the pronunciation right. Um, since October 4th. Um, so... Uh, at least 15 people have been arrested so far locking onto the logging machinery, trying to slow down the disruption. Um, the, the, the campaigners have uh, are trying to save the trees and the endangered greater glider and koalas, the, the wildlife in the area. Um, Susie Russell, one of the activists from Northeast Forest Alliance, said uh, that every hour these machines don't work, it's 50 trees, 50 trees saved. So that's actually quite you know, quite a large return on on activist effort. I think if you can if you can uh, keep those machines locked down. 
Yeah, the, the police are really ramping up their repression as well, as you, as you mentioned, 15 people arrested uh, so far. There might have even been more, um, like there kind of seems to be, you know, one or two more people being arrested every day. Um, but you can follow those campaigns on the Save Bulga Forest Facebook page. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different campaigns for different forests around um, New South Wales that are being threatened with logging. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, the uh, endangered species that live there, these are vital habitats for. Um, but also, yeah, obviously, we want to protect native forests for a whole bunch of different reasons. So uh, we'll keep up to date with those campaigns uh, online. Um, now, uh, going international, there's been some devastating uh, climate disasters around the world uh, this year. Um, we touched on a few of them on the episode with Zach Schofield, but one of those is the uh, huge uh, bushfires across um, South America. So there are more than 300,000 fires that have burned more than 200 million acres and killed hundreds of people across South America this year. So uh, Brazil and Bolivia have had the worst fires, but there's also been fires in Peru, Argentina, Ecuador, Colombia, and Paraguay. Yeah, so I saw in our coverage that uh, 60%, which is just, just monumental, if you look at the size of Brazil, that's you know an enormous area land. 60% of Brazil is covered in smoke in September, which, I mean, I'm, I'm, personally, I'm quite terrified about that. Yeah, it's, um, it's very scary. Um, another kind of scary side of it is uh, the, the fact that the Brazilian uh, part of the Amazon rainforest, you know, the Amazon is, you know, a, usually a, a massive carbon sink, it draws down heaps of carbon out of the atmosphere. People talk about it as uh, the Earth's lungs and things like that. Well, because of how much fire, uh, how much has been burnt, all the uh, smoke and carbon that gets emitted into the air in, in these big wildfires, um, the Amazon has turned from a big carbon sink into one of the biggest carbon emitters in the world. Um, so that's obviously going to have exacerbate the kind of impact of greenhouse uh, gases and carbon emissions that are or that's already happening. Um, so yeah, that's pretty scary. Yeah. And, um, just as a side, if I remember my uh, high school geography correctly, there's kind of a, an element to those rainforests and similar rainforests where they rely on the the humidity surrounding themselves in order to to perpetuate how they they function and so with fires like this you you actually end up drying out a large portion of the rainforest which means more of it will burn and less of it can function because it will like you know those trees rely on it being wet year round so it's it's not just the this fire but it's actually the, the long-term cascade effects that these fires are going to have um and, you know I, you know i'm certainly not a um um, what is it, a geologist or a meteorologist, whatever, whatever scientific, scientific field covers that. But um, I can still tell that's, that's really not good. Yeah, well, um, what the kind of experts have been saying is that these fires have been driven by severe droughts, high temperatures and low rainfall. And that's all a byproduct of the changing climate and the global temperatures rising. Um, so that's like a huge, a uh, huge driver of the, the, why these fires are so much worse than, uh, they have been previously. Uh, another aspect that's making them a lot worse is, uh, the kind of agribusiness practices. So there's lots of land clearing, um, monoculture, like farming where only one crop is grown for massive areas, which means they're a lot less resistant. Um, and then also the huge water consumption that these agribusiness farms kind of take up the sucking heaps of uh, uh, moisture out of the soil and out of the uh, surrounding area. And it, as you said about the, the um, importance of humidity and having access to water for the forest to kind of uh, survive. So it's um, uh, all looking pretty bad and, and drives home the need to, you know, kind of force action from um, to make to governments to actually take serious action to stop uh, all these practices and to um, do something about you know, the climate emission, uh, carbon emissions that are impacting the climate as well. Uh, yeah, so back at home, uh, Labor and the Coalition teamed up on October the 10th to push through another law to facilitate its AUKUS nuclear submarine plan. 
The Australian Naval Nuclear Power Safety Act 2024 allows high-level naval nuclear waste to be dumped anywhere in Australia. So that's um, basically signing a big check for the US in, in particular to take a big dump anywhere they like. Um, to get the, the analogy. Um, initially, it allowed all waste from British and, U nuclear, British and US nuclear subs to be dumped but it was amended to just spent nuclear fuel, which I don't think it actually makes that much of a difference. I mean, spent nuclear fuel is still is still radioactive waste. So it's that's not really, you know, the win that I think the government wanted to present that as. Um, two dumps, one at Garden Island off the coast of WA here and uh, the other at Port Adelaide uh, were... Decided on with no community consultation. I know I'm, I'm not sure about the situation in Adelaide. I'm, I've been uh, involved in the Stop AUKUS Alliance here in, in WA, uh, and there's been quite actually a, a big community push against these. You know, several petitions to councils, big protests outside of councils. Um, you know, uh, protests outside of the state government, and trying to push. You know, every political level uh, we can. To try and get councils and state government to, to say no but so far i think we had some success with the Fremantle council but the coburn council which is which is the council that covers garden island is uh quite you know they just don't care they they're very conservative they're they've actually got quite a number of environmentally disastrous projects on the go all at once so there's not likely to be much success with them uh and garden island for those who don't know is it used to be quite a nice uh, nice kind of nature reserve that you could just take a boat up to. And I, I went there once as a kid. Uh, and sometime in the last 15 years, they turned it into a, I think, one of the, the largest naval bases we have here in Australia. Uh, so that's, so Garden Island is uh, proposed to be one of the major nexuses of the, uh, the AUKUS submarines and, you know, one of the biggest ports where we keep both the nuclear subs and therefore, you know, where we have the nuclear subs, the nuclear waste that they produce. Yeah, and as you said, there's no, there's been no real community consultation and uh, obviously no one wants a nuclear waste dump next to their backyard or next to their kid's school or anything like that. Um, but this, basically this legislation means that, you know, either this government or any future governments can say, well, we've already, you know, we can put it here if we want. We've got permission, we've got, uh, legally we can, you know, dump waste wherever we want. Um, so it's pretty terrible and that, you know, uh, they, there's only two dumps at the moment, but those that could easily expand as, as uh, kind of nuclear powered submarines or, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, things like that. It's kind of a pushing the door open for Australia to go, uh, nuclear, which is something we really need to oppose as, um, this is what, uh, Greens, uh, uh, Senator David Shoebridge said to be clear exposure to even intermediate level waste is lethal to humans and the risks last hundreds of years so yeah that's the other thing it's not you know we'll dump this waste and it's a problem for five years it's a problem for basically forever dealing with what to do with nuclear waste um has been a huge problem uh worldwide and we don't want australia to become the dumping ground for everyone's nuclear waste either so that's another kind of scary story, but we wanted to finish this section of the podcast on a bit of a good news story, a bit of a win. And that's uh, that community environment and First Nations groups are breathing a sigh of relief after years of campaigning to protect marine life. And because they forced a multinational gas exploration company, TGS, to withdraw its plan to conduct the world's largest seismic blasting project which was going to be off the southwest, uh, the coast of southwest Victoria. So there's this, been this huge years-long campaign, more than 30,000 public submissions were made to oppose this seismic blasting project, um, and, and they've actually won it. So that's a great, great news. So for people who don't know, seismic blasting is basically firing these huge air gun blasts underwater every 10 seconds for like 24 hours a day and this one was set to go for 400 days in the southern ocean uh, and those those underwater kind of air blasts reach up to 250 decibels which is louder than atomic bombs 
and that has a massive impact on marine life, uh, particularly whales who obviously communicate through um, sound uh, and, you know, also leads to kind of destruct destruction of other marine life, uh, sea, country and song lines. And uh, as the first step in kind of um, gas exploration, it then, you know, they find gas, they start drilling it, drilling it up. So it's an all round really bad uh, thing that has, that's been... Um, defeated which is a, a really good success story there's some really good photos actually uh one of the protests they did uh was all these surfers and like locals down in, uh, in torquay in victoria uh paddled out on together there was over a thousand people on surfboards and like uh, other kind of life rafts and stuff paddled out into the ocean and there's some great photos of that online um that you can find right, look. yeah it, it, it kind of reminded me of a uh, of the rising tide people's blockade from last year where we had all the kayaks out there, but instead it's all surfboards. And, you know, one of the successes of this campaign is it wasn't just you, the climate activists or, you know, the usual kind of people who got involved. It was, it became a massive community campaign, um, of people from all walks of life, but, uh, that got involved and that's what led to its victory. So, um, that's a really good win. And if you can find out about basically all of these stories that we've talked about, uh, we've only briefly summarized them. You can find out a lot more information and detail by going to the green left website, greenleft.org.au, And we'll put the links to all of these articles in the podcast description as well. So as the need to address runaway climate change becomes more and more urgent, Many are looking for quick and easy solutions that will, you know, allow things to continue as normal. And uh, Labor's 2024 budget put the ambition for Australia to become a green or renewable energy superpower. But what does this actually mean in practice? And is there a better alternative that we should be pushing for? So to discuss these ideas, we're joined by Green Left journalist and socialist activist Peter Boyle. Welcome to the podcast, Peter. Hi. So... Can you explain this uh, green superpower push? Well, I think it starts off like many ideas. Uh, you know, it's a bit of an academic discussion, um, but then it's taken up by, in this particular case, by some of the uh, environmental NGOs who are looking for an argument to persuade government that they should uh, support a faster transition to renewable energy. So one of the arguments that is, um, you know, has become known as the uh, argument for Australia to become a green or renewable energy superpower is the idea that Australia has got a comparative advantage. And this is an old sort of market economics term uh, in the era of, uh, you know, uh, the shift to renewable base, uh, global shift to renewable base energy. And this is because Australia's got lots of sunshine, lots of wind. And, and to add to that, they argue that Australia has got um, many of the mineral resources that are required in uh, uh, renewable uh, energy technologies. So the, the arguments pitched to the Australian capitalist class is that, um, you know, if you, if, if, if you embrace this, uh, this shift, uh, you can make bucket loads of money. And uh, Australia uh, could become a renewable energy superpower. And now, I, I think there's something really strange about this. I, I, I don't like the language, you know. Um, Eco-socialist writer and, and academic uh, Jason Hickel has pointed out, you know, that they're really, this is really a false dream. There is no climate-safe future globally if we are not prepared to break from the you know the 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 un inequalities of the world today it's separation between you know the old colonial powers that you know still hegemonize the world's resources and the majority countries which are exploited and super exploited uh, by them uh, because it's it's very much part of the problem itself um it is this total separation between uh, social need, and we're talking here global social need, and the urgency of addressing what's a global crisis. Um, um, it's this, the, the cleavage between that 
and the interests of huge monopolies that actually dominate the global economy wanting to make more profits. So if the environment movement is going to pitch to, to the capitalist class, hey, you can continue this dominance, this monopoly power, this superpower status, uh, then you know, you're going to be just encouraging uh, the problem to keep going. We've got to make a break from it. And that's the argument which I think uh, we come at. See, unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, some of the environment NGOs are so desperate to, to sort of get a hearing, you know, in, in government, um, among officialdom, and even among big business, that they go down this path. But no sooner have they let the, 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 uh, what do you call it? the, the word, the term become a, a, a buzzword, uh, you know, and governments have started to pick it up, they start to realise that uh, the vision that the government's putting forward, even a Labour government, is very different from the vision that they had uh, for this uh, uh, Australia's uh, future as, uh, as, as a green superpower. See, in Australia, basically, uh, the Labour government has taken up the term, but the way in which it has implemented it through a program announced in the last budget called Future Made in Australia, it's basically a program of uh, tax concessions for big companies that have already got the investment and made the investment in certain areas and they'll be able to basically, you know, um, get a, a, a huge tax concession if they're classed as being, uh, you know, within the framework of turning Australia into a <laughs> renewable energy superpower. Um, and, and that's all that amounts to. And, and very little of the dreams that some of these um, uh, environmental NGOs had are actually part of the story. Uh, the idea of actually far, uh, speeding up the transition, uh, 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 the, the transition down of the fossil fuel industry, it's nowhere in the picture. In fact, the Labor government makes it clear that uh, the expansion of the gas industry uh, is part of its vision uh, for, for, for the transition. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think we all know that, um, you know, just purely on a very simple logical level, you know, this transition to a green superpower still means infinite growth. I mean, I, I, I was wondering, do you, do you think it's, is it simply that the, you know, transitioning to a green superpower, cap green capitalist system still requires you know, an endless accumulation of resources, growth, natural resources that is, you know, simply finite on the planet? Or is there more to the logic of why um, the worldwide inequality is incompatible with uh, addressing climate change? Well, I'm, I think in the first instance, it, it impacts on, on what, you know, uh, resources are spent on in, the, in in this period of emergency, and it's an emergency because time is basically running out very fast. It probably, you know, it has run out to keep within the target of uh, 1.5 degrees rise. Definitely, we're going to go above it before you can pull back. Uh, but um, it, literally every second counts. And if we say that uh, our approach to the transition is going to be basically uh, let the capitalists do the transition in the way that is going to make them the most money, it's not necessarily going to be, well, it definitely is not going to be the best uh, use of resources in an urgent situation. Let, let me give you a concrete example uh, of, of this, you know, like, you know, supposing, you know, we wanted to put all our resources into addressing the, uh, the you know, as fast as possible, make the transition, you know, it, to renewable energy. See, on average now, just in the Australian grid, you know, um, on average about 40% is coming from re renewable energy resources. Um, actually, last weekend, it actually, uh, for a little while, flipped to over 50%, which is, which, is, which is interesting, you know. But at the same time, you've got uh, the fossil fuel companies saying, no, 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 no we need gas, and they, they're raising all sorts of bullshit arguments uh, why, you know, gas is uh, transition fuel, etc. Their main objective is to actually sell, sell uh, you know, gas and continue to sell coal, actually, to, to uh, trading partners in the region. And, and they want to make money from that, even as they contemplate perhaps, you know, investing a little bit. And actually, some of the major fossil fuel companies have already started investing 
in renewable energy because they see, you know, money making prospects in the future, but they don't want to give up what they've got. So if if you if if you make them make the resources, they will actually uh, go to maximize their profits. They will drag out the transition so they can use up their their, their interests in the fossil fuels, and they will also shape the way the investment goes into renewable energy to a way that can make money. So, for instance, if you think in Australia, there's one plan which is being talked about a bit and is actually kind of like starting up, and that's the idea uh, um, to a, a private enterprise thing to, to build this giant solar farm up in the Northern Territory to build a cable uh, from Australia to Singapore to basically sell Singapore and other countries in the region uh, renewable energy, you know. Uh, <laughs> but when you think of it, you know, like all that resources is going basically to capture something which is, you know, free, solar power, put it in a form that it can be a money-making option, you know. In the meantime, everything else, investment is not going into other stuff, you know, stuff like... Um, you know, helping help, helping you know um, Australia's uh, uh, own uh, energy system move to more permanently beyond the forty percent to capitalise on the huge take up on, of solar energy, which you know Australia's got a big take up by households, thirty percent. But you got this bizarre situation where the capitalist companies that control the system are saying no, 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 no. You know, discouraging uh, the the use of some of that energy. Uh, paying a pittance, even wanting to say, uh, to 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 make people waste some of the energy that's being generated from rooftop solar, you know, it's incredible how everything is distorted. Um, so you know, finally, I mean, I think it's it 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 uh, you know because if you recognise that 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 uh, this is a global problem, you know, just as we recognise, you know, um, you know, uh, many other social crises. Uh, like, for instance, COVID-19, you know, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a social problem. You've got to all help each other to, to do the best. Our attitude to the region should not start from the point of view of how best Australian capitalists can exploit our neighbours, but rather how we can help our neighbours speed up the transition. Uh, and, and I think as a model for our relationships with our neighbours in the era of transition to renewable energy, we should not be thinking about maintaining our superpower status, but rather we should be thinking of acting like good neighbours, to act more like, say, a country like Cuba with its um, uh, medical aid programs in the region, you know? You said that's, 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 that's a sort of a, a, a completely different concept of how we relate to other countries in this era. Yeah, I'd like to go a little bit more into that idea of the uh, green good neighbor or what kind of a, a more positive future could look like. But just before we get into that, I just wanted to ask about in your article, you write that Australia would need the military might to enforce the status of uh, being a green uh, superpower. So I guess what's the connection between militarism and this kind of push for renewable energy um, from the private businesses? Well, I think in, in, in general, if you want to be a superpower and you know, that, that means you want to maintain yourself as being in a position of greater power than, than other countries, right? And in all of human history, um, while economics is a, is a big part of it, it's gone hand in hand with military might. So the United States, which was the you know, dominant economic power for much of the last century, and maybe now it's been challenged a little bit, is still pretty dominant. You know, had a military power uh, to, the, to to go along with it, and to help to enforce the kind of rules that made sure that the companies that are based in their country could extract the super profits that they do. And currently, Australia is actually enmeshed in that very system of military dominance that has gone hand in hand with the uh, with, with the United States superpower status, defending it, defending its privileges, and defending its power all around the world. Uh, you know, if, if, if anything, Australia has sort of become increasingly an extension of that military machine. Now, just because we flip the superpower uh, technology to renewable, but we still want to keep the superpower thing, then, you know, we're going to have the, the same imperative to be part of the, the gang of 
of rich countries that seeks to protect their power. Well, in actual fact, this is not an abstraction. This is real. And uh, a big danger is in the very minimal system of tax subsidies uh, that are being floated uh, through the, the Future Made in Australia program that the Labor government has, has introduced, it's quite possible that uh, some of the money will end up subsidising the arms industry and going into the increased militarisation program, which is part of the government's policy as well, to turn Australia into a major, to one of the world's top 10 arms exporters, you know. Uh, they will say, oh, we're part of this uh, <laughs> super, you know, turning Australia into a green superpower. So, so the connection, I think, is, is, is both in, 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 in broad general terms is a possibility, but it's also actually in reality happening now. I think it's very much integrated into, uh, you know, the various schemes for Australia to, the Australian governments and Australian public actually in the end to subsidise um, future profit-making opportunities for Australian capitalists. Yeah, so um, going back to, to what you were talking about earlier, obviously you touched on that with, um, you know, the comparison to Cuba's medical aid program and such, but could you expand a little bit more on what the alternative and what the concept of a, a green good neighbour rather than a green superpower would, would look like for Australia? So specifically, you know, I think one of the things that make it easier for us to understand this is um, looking at Australia's relation with the uh, small island states in the South Pacific, you know. Um, in the recent uh, South Pacific, uh, Pacific Island Forum Leaders Summit, uh, Australia was sort of caught sort of like in a hot mic situation, or well, was Anthony Albanese, our Prime Minister, talking to the um, a U.S. Uh, Secretary of State who was present there, talking about you know how they had successfully, how they access successfully uh, pressured the Pacific countries into uh, accepting a Australian policing uh, relationship, which would see an increase Australian intervention to police forces of those countries, and uh, on the other hand, coming from the Pacific side, there were all these concerns that are being expressed about Australia to get serious about uh, moving away from fossil fuels because uh, the Pacific Island states are going to be some of the frontline states suffering from uh, sea level rises. I mean, some of the islands are already starting to, you know, go under in, in, in Kiribati and in Tuvalu, etc. And um, so, you know, there's Australia coming there, muscling around, using its you know, it's minor superpower status alongside the bigger U.S. superpower status to have its way, uh, wanting to the, to push the island states not only to do its bidding in terms of you know having a, Australia a bigger role in in, in its uh, police forces, but also wants uh, to get the island states to agree to Australia to host a future COP uh, climate summit in Australia, so that Australia can be like the big brother spokesperson for the South Pacific. Uh, you know, they, they're, not, they're not listening. You know, they're just bullying their way through. You know, they could, they should listen to the island states. They say, urgently, you know, put your, you know, put your, put your action where, where your mouth is. You say you're against, you know, that you're for climate action. Well, you know, stop this increase in, in, in uh, developing your, your fossil fuel exports. Help us with technology so that we can take up um, uh, renewable energy faster, but also help us with uh, amelioration because we've got a problem now. You know, Australia has been a big cause of the problem of the Pacific Island states. So what are you going to do about it? You know, uh, are you going to, you, you know, we will have places disappearing. Are you going to have a, a change your immigration policy so you can welcome climate refugees are going to be inevitably coming in this direction? Um, how you can help us survive. So that would be part of the uh, a, a good neighbour policy. So um, that's kind of the list of questions that we've come to. Is there anything else you wanted to add before we uh, wrap up? No, I think, you know, I think that the discussion will, you know, will become more critical in the future. I think that the naivety with which uh, maybe some of the bigger um, climate NGOs approach this question of uh, a green superpower, this concept of a green superpower, you know, has already, you know, uh, you know, 
come to the stage of you know a bit more critical comments because they they can see the, the the disconnect. You know, it's it's one thing for you to make sort of all sorts of nice arguments to convince the capitalists um, to to do something good, but then there's their greed and their interests, and uh, it's just so obvious. You know, it's so obvious in the world today. It's incompatible. You know, we have to have a sort of a uh, you know fundamentally a society first rather than a corporate profit first approach if we you know if we even really want to you know address this question of transition with the speed we we want to let alone with 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 social justice and equity in mind agreed well thanks so much for joining us on the podcast this week peter we'll definitely have you back at some point in the future thanks that's about all we've got time for for this episode of the green left news podcast um you can find out uh, more about all the stories we talked about today uh, in the link in the description. And we've also got a link to find out more about the Rising Tide People's Blockade, which is coming up in late November. And that's going to be a massive climate rally. But there's also, uh, you know, heaps of other protests and actions that are happening. Obviously, the uh, Palestine rallies are continuing. And um, you can find your nearest local events at greenleft.org.au forward slash events. I'd just like to thank Sean Valenzuela or Little Archer Beats for the music that you heard on this podcast. And uh, just a final plug, please consider becoming a Green Left supporter at greenleft.org.au forward slash support. It makes a massive difference to help us continue uh, as a people-powered activist media platform. We don't take any kind of corporate advertising or sponsorships or anything like that. So it's all relying on our generous supporters and readers and listeners to help us continue. Um, so thanks for listening to this episode. Thanks, everyone. Bye.